having a wonderful holiday weekend. Molly Karam here holding it down in Bristol. Stephen A and Max are in the Big Apple. Gentlemen, good morning. What's up? What's up? How y'all doing? Molly? Good morning. What's up, Happy Stephen A? Day. Yes, yes. What's up? Likewise. Let's go. All right, guys, let's do it. Yes, good morning. Coming up on the show, Grizzly star point guard Mike Conley is here. How does he feel about Kevin Durant joining the Warriors? Find out that in just a bit. But we start with Sam Bradford, who signed a lucrative two-year deal with Philadelphia before the season was expected to be the team's starting quarterback. But now he is no longer an Eagle. The Vikings acquired Bradford in a trade with the Eagles on Saturday. Minnesota was in dire need for a quarterback after Teddy Bridgewater went down with a torn ACL in practice last week. Let's take a look at what the Vikings had to give up to get Bradford. Philly will receive Minnesota's first-round draft pick in 2017, as well as a conditional fourth-rounder in 2018. The Eagles now plan to start the number two overall pick in this year's draft, Carson Wentz, according to ESPN's Adam Kaplan. Stephen A., let's start with you here. Is Sam Bradford the right man for the Vikings? Believe it or not, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want anybody to faint here, but I have no problem with this whatsoever. My answer would be a yes, an emphatic yes, I might add. And I know my man Max Kellerman will get a bit more emotional and philosophical, and I'll let him do that in just a second. But I must say to you that when I think about Sam Bradford with the Minnesota Vikings, I have no problem with this. I'm certainly no fan of Sam Bradford. We all know this. The man, it'll be a miracle if he starts 16 games for crying out loud, let alone be productive to the point of the star. That, that, that we love to celebrate. But when you consider the team that he is going to, let's acknowledge the fact that we're talking about the Minnesota Vikings here, a team that had the second worst passing attack in all of football last year, but still made it to the playoffs, still won the NFC North. They've got the best running back in football, Adrian Peterson. Okay, they've got a, they've got a good offensive line. They've got a stout defense. They've got an exceptional head coach. They even got good play, uh, good play calling from you in terms of not play calling but good coaching from the offensive line and from an offensive coordinator standpoint, you've got North Turner in there. So what you're doing by acquiring Sam Bradford is you're saying, look, Here's what we need you to do. Make sure you can make a deep pass. Make sure that they can't cheat, suffocate the line of scrimmage, and key on Adrian Peterson. Don't, don't sit up there and overcompensate because they know we don't have a passing attack. We've got a quarterback that can actually throw the ball downfield. To a Laquan Treadwell, to a Stephon Diggs, to a Kyle Rudolph with the best running back in football. If I'm looking at it from that perspective, and I'm essentially saying I've got an elite running back, and I've got a damn good defense, okay, and and that alone was enough to get me to the playoffs with the second worst passing attack in all of football. I'm not phased by giving up a first round pick because how big of a deal is that first round pick going to be? I'm not going to be somebody that's going to not going to miss the playoffs and, and end up giving you a top five pick or something like that. I expect to be in the postseason. I expect to be good. So when I look at it from that perspective, Max, I got to tell you, I really didn't have a problem with it. Not at all. Well, in a vacuum, you'd be right, Stephen A. In a vacuum, Minnesota really had a need there. And Sam Bradford is a, look, he's a guy who's never had a real team around him. And, but his, throughout his career so far, we're talking about a veteran, marginal starting quarterback but not branded as such because he's maintained a starter's position and he was drafted number one overall. But Sam Bradford would be fine in a vacuum, as I said, if there wasn't someone else available who made more sense and was cheaper, and that's Colin Kaepernick, who doesn't have the starting job right now in San Francisco, whose stock is low right now, who you could pick up for less than this. First of all, I gotta say about the Eagles, before I even get into the Kaepernick stuff, it's a great trade for the Eagles, because the Eagles essentially, when you cancel out all the picks they gave up for Wentz and then got back in the Bradford deal, they're, they basically are trading a number two pick in two, uh, sorry, a second round pick in 2018, and a, as I said, a marginal veteran quarterback, you know, who's overpaid, let's face it, based on production for the number two overall pick in the draft, Carson Wentz. That's really what it boiled down to. Great trade for the Eagles. But from the Vikings' point of view, Colin Kaepernick is out there, Stephen A. He would not be as expensive to pick up as Bradford in terms of what you have to give up. And in terms of the actual expense, Bradford has $22 million guaranteed left. Kaepernick has 27. He's not even that much more expensive. Bradford's top QBR 
And this was over only seven games because he got hurt that year. 52. That was in 2013. Never had a QBR over 50. No, he didn't have a lot around him, but still, Colin Kaepernick's top QBR, 69 in 2012, went to the Super Bowl, 66 in 2013, one pass away from the Super Bowl. Kaepernick's pedigree in the pros is simply qualitatively higher than Bradford's. Why wouldn't you want that guy who you have to give up less for? Well, a couple of things. Number one, qualitatively is a word that you consistently throw out there. I'm still not defined. I'm still not sure what that word means, but that's okay. You're more intelligent than I am. What can the I quality. say? Let's get that. Let's let's throw that out of the way. Qualitatively, you love to throw that out. Of course, I know what it means. I'm just messing with you. But you also talk about looking at things in a vacuum. Well, Max, I'm the wrong person to throw that analogy to because I vacuum myself all the time. I actually know what it's like to live in a vacuum. It's practically living in a vacuum for crying out loud because I love to vacuum almost as much as I love to iron. Can't you tell? Well, anyway, having said all of that, let's be clear. Have, no matter what you say or no matter what you think, what you're not paying attention to, Max Kellerman, is this. Colin Kaepernick right now is a distraction. And not only is he a distraction that Minnesota doesn't need because they're not some scrub team on a come up. They're actually vying for a Super Bowl championship. You also have to take into consideration that for the last couple of years, he hasn't been that stellar as a passer. What's their Achilles heel? Their ability to pass the ball. Teddy Bridgewater had wheels. He could run and scramble out of the pocket. He could make plays with his legs, not as well as Colin Kaepernick could, but he could do it the issue was could you drop back in the pocket and throw from the pocket as a pocket passer in the National Football League under no circumstances am I proclaiming that Sam Bradford is elite in any way but he did throw for nearly 4,000 yards last year that wasn't the first time he's done that in his career he does have an arm he does have the ability to throw the ball deep you did draft Laquan Treadwell who's about 6'2 almost 230 can go up and get it who's deceptively quick if not fast even though it was 4'6 and a 40 wasn't that impressive at the NFL scouting combine you've got to look at all of these things and piece it together and come to the conclusion that for this particular team at this particular moment Sam Bradford was the best available quarterback and even better option than Colin Kaepernick I don't know. Look, Bradford can pass in one way exception, or very well. His best ability is down the field. Kaepernick got a big arm. He can chuck it down the field. He can not chuck it, throw it down the field. Not um, accurately. In terms of who Kaepernick? You see, That's he right. looked pretty good the other night, Stephen A. Uh, really? Really? And, That's and where as we I said, when, A preseason when, game? Is, well, is that where we going? Well, I mean, I gave, you, <laughs> I gave you full seasons. I gave you full seasons where his QBR was significantly higher than Bradford who's never really been good in that regard. And in terms of the distraction that Kaepernick is, there's been some talk recently. There was that uh, state congressman from San Diego said Kaepernick maybe feels comfortable doing what he did in San Francisco. And he wouldn't feel that way yeah. in San Diego. Some nonsense like that because of yeah. the kind of political climate in, in San Francisco. Minnesota is a state of independent thinkers. They sent a guy from the WWF at the time, Jesse Ventura, who had, had once been there, to the governor's mansion. They sent Al Franken from SNL to the Senate, I think they can deal with Colin Kaepernick starting okay. at quarterback. I, I, I'll drop the mic with this one last statement, Max Kellerman, and it really, really comes down to this. When you sit up there and you look at Colin Kaepernick, you can say what you want, but at the end of the day, Sam Bradford was in St. Louis. Did you forget that? Who was his coach? Did you forget that? These are the kind of things you have to remember. <laughs> playing for Jeff Fisher in St. Louis might be a little bit different than playing for Zimmer in Minnesota with the, re with the rest of the team around him. That's all I'm going to say. Mm, we will leave it there, the details. So Max would have liked to see Kaepernick get a shot there in Minnesota. Stephen A., good with Bradford. We have another familiar face, though, gentlemen, in a new place, and we focus on the Cowboys now. Jerry Jones <laughs> and the Cowboys making some big moves at quarterback this weekend. Again, in the headlines, the team was in need of a quarterback after Tony Romo suffered a compression fracture in his back, that on August 25th against the Seahawks. Sources say he'll be out six to ten weeks. Luckily for them, the Broncos cut Mark Sanchez on Saturday, allowing Dallas to sign him. To make room for Sanchez, the Cowboys waived quarterback Jameel Showers. Rookie Dak Prescott is still expected to be the starter in Romo's absence. Max, start with you. Does signing Mark Sanchez make sense for Dallas? 
perfect sense. This makes perfect sense for Dallas. First of all, Jer Jerry Jones ideally would like to put the best football team on the field. That can also put the meat in the seats. That's also interesting. Mark Sanchez in this regard fills the, the capacity. What are you la laughing at, Stephen A? Mark Sanchez, when... when Go, sorry. Yeah. Go, when sorry. last Go, seen? Go Go when? Ahead. See, you just downplayed the, the the preseason, right? So now you want to <laughs> play up the preseason, or do you want to play up the last time Mark Sanchez played most of a season, which was nine games for the Eagles two years ago, had a QBR of 59. Now we're not talking about a star starting quarterback in Mark Sanchez, obviously, although he has that kind of level of fame and notoriety around the league, but. As a backup? You're talking about as a veteran backup to Dak Prescott? At, what, you're going to do better than Mark Sanchez at this moment, who you don't have to give up anything for? You just sign him for the money, no draft picks, no nonsense? Who's better than Mark Sanchez out there that you're going to pick up? And who has the kind of not just QBR but Q rating that will make Jerry Jones happy? He's perfect. Well, first of all, keep your rhetorical questions to a minimum on this show, Max Kellerman, because I got answers for you. I don't want you just asking a question. How about Geno Smith? Yes, better than Mark Sanchez, as far as I'm concerned, simply because Mark Sanchez has what? a history of ineptitude. Listen, that's right, I said it. Because Mark Sanchez has a history of ineptitude, the jury is still out on Geno, not out and outside of New York, not in New York. I know New York is done with him. We're done They're with him. They're filing but in Smith that jury. It's not looking it good, Stephen A. Listen, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a problem. I mean, I pondered a thought. I would have a problem in the Dallas Cowboys went out and got Christian Ponder. But let me say this. Let me say this, because this is hilarious. The last four years Mark Sanchez played in New York City, he was more famous for his hairdo and who he dated than his game. Then he leaves, he departs, he goes to Philadelphia. He shows up for a few games right up until the moment you believe in him, and then he stinks up the joint, okay? Then he comes to Denver this year. After Philadelphia is just done with him, he comes to Denver this year. And he loses out to a Trevor Simeon who was drafted in the seventh round in 2015, didn't throw an NFL pass last year. So essentially, he's a rookie, a novice, breath smeller like Similac, wet behind the ears. And somehow he found a way to beat Mark Sanchez. And you're telling me Mr. Butt Fumble himself, okay, who ran into a whole bunch of beef pork or whatever you want to call it when his face got planted in a backside of a, a of a defender on a Thanksgiving night a few years back, and you're telling me that dude, Mark Sanchez, is a good fit for the Dallas Cowboys? Let me tell you something right now. Yeah. Here's what's a good fit for the Dallas Cowboys. Here's what makes it hilarious. Once again, they got somebody that's going to provide a headline. They've got somebody that you're going to laugh at. They got somebody that you're going to scratch your head like you got dandruff over. They've got somebody that you're going to look at and say, hey, you know what? I can't believe they've done it again. These are the Dallas Cowboys. Just when you think they are done being the accident waiting to happen. Just when you think that enough's enough. The weed and, and people getting in trouble and, and Tony Romo hurting his back because he doesn't know how to slide. And then on top of at all. We ain't even getting to Randy Gregory. Oh, oh he, he, he won his appeal and his suspension is going to be reduced. Let's have a celebration. Everybody forgetting the fact that he was, why he was celebrated, why he was suspended to begin with. Forget all of that other stuff. Forget the dudes robbing the, 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 the department store of drawers and some cologne. Forget all that. And the list goes on and on. These, you know what? I, 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 I'm going to take it back. I'm going to announce it on national television, y'all. I'm going to make some news today. You know what? Maybe I I am a Dallas Cowboy fan because they make me laugh. They just, I, I cannot believe the things that they do to make me feel so good about watching football. The Dallas Cowboys are an accident waiting to happen. They are a joke of a yeah. franchise as far as I'm concerned. And they bring this on themselves. The, all the talent that they have, they continuously get in their way. Just to steal just to steal headlines, and this is the latest example. Thank you, Cowboys. Mwah, mwah. How about them Cowboys? They just never let you down. Just never let you down. Well, that that <laughs> I, I can I can definitely co-sign that sentiment as a Giants fan, Stephen A. But when you talk about Mark Sanchez, let's take this back to Mark Sanchez, which is the original point. Is he was that a smart move? Is that the right fit? Yes, it is. Why did he lose Please. out to Trevor Simeon? Because if you're the Broncos he's not good and you're going you're gonna, to oh, 
because you're going to owe Mark Sanchez four, four and a half million dollars you can get out of paying while you develop a younger guy you just drafted, younger, cheaper, better for the future, and not appreciably different. If you watch any preseason, it's not like Simeon looked a lot better than Sanchez. It's just that Sanchez didn't separate himself from the others. And since he was more expensive, they made Hold a it. business decision. Stop right there. Here stop, the stop, Cowboys stop, stop, stop. get to time scoop out. up. Time out. Time out. Time out. Max Kellerman. I'm sorry, when did, Max, yep. when did Mark Sanchez get drafted? Was it 2009? So a guy that's been yep. in the NFL since 2009 goes to Denver, talks about how he's hell-bent on capturing the starting job for the Denver Broncos, the reigning defending Super Bowl champions, and loses out to a dude that has never thrown an NFL pass in his career? And you're telling me, well, you know, yeah. what's the shame in that? I mean, it's not that big of a deal. I mean, he really didn't get outplayed. Excuse me, oh, this I'm dude didn't have Mark a Sanchez business being in the same starter. stratosphere. He didn't have any business being in the no, same I'm stratosphere saying, as Mark Sanchez. I'm not, making, I'm not making the claim that Mark Sanchez is a starter. But if you're looking for a veteran backup, like, a couple days before the season starts, go do better than Mark Sanchez. And you don't have well, to give up anything but the money, and it's not that much money. So, so, this so makes sense. And in terms of being, in terms of wanting the headlines, he does that too. That's just yeah, yeah, bonus yeah, yeah. in this so, case. So, 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 Mark Sanchez, congratulations. You're a backup to a rookie who hasn't thrown a regular NBA NFL season uh, pass. Congratulations, so you lost out to a seventh round pick in 2015 who never threw a pass last year. And you're coming to be a backup to a rookie that has never thrown an NFL regular season pass. Mark Sanchez, congratulations. Congratulations. Guys, it's so, it's, it's, we're so touched. We got, we're we, so touched. We gotta go to break here. So cheery on this holiday. Sanchez has committed more turnovers per snap than any active quarterback, but he is four and two in six career playoff games. When we go in the heart of Texas, the Trojans and the Crimson Tide. Hurts shows the off, throws it into the end zone for a touchdown. Deflection intercepted. Humphrey. Unbelievably dramatic turnaround. And the beatdown is on. Harris gets out of that trouble. Puts himself in some more. Picked off by Dakota Dixon. Number five goes down. Ward to throw. He's got McCloskey. And he's got a touchdown. They knock off Oklahoma 33-23. Notre Dame and Texas. Here we go. Hines are downfield. And what an athlete. What a play into the end zone by EQ. They've played well enough to win, but they've got to figure it out right here. What a for overtime. Swoops with it, turns, and shakes off one tackle. Still on his feet. Blue goal line. He dies. Touchdown. Texas wins. And the Longhorns have beaten 10th ranked Notre Dame. It's back, and it was a wild opening weekend in college football. Two of the top five teams took L's as Houston upset number three Oklahoma and unranked Wisconsin, edging out number five LSU, number one Bama, beat the brakes off of USC 52-6. to six. And last night, we saw a double OT thriller where Texas upset Notre Dame in dramatic fashion. It was a rough week overall for the top ten teams. Listen to this. Three of them have a one in the loss column already. Number four, Florida State still has to play number 11 Ole Miss. That one tonight on ESPN at 8 p.m. And after tonight, week one will have featured the most losses by ranked teams in college football history. No bueno, Stephen A. What was the biggest surprise from the weekend in college football by your estimation? Well, for me, it was Houston uh, smacking up uh, Oklahoma because I watched that entire game. I saw bits and pieces of other games, but obviously I watched the entire Alabama roll tide. I wasn't surprised by that. But I watched Houston beat up Oklahoma, and Oklahoma got beat up. I mean, it's one of those situations where you're looking at Stoops right now and wondering what the hell is going on. Uh, you would like to say that the Oklahoma Sumas seemed ill-prepared, but that wasn't it at all. Houston showed up. Uh, Oklahoma was in a little bit of control early in terms of their physicality, but then Houston just stepped it up and started, you know, just, just getting in their face. They were harassing Baker Mayfield all afternoon long. They made his life a living hell. The offensive side line seemed ill-equipped uh, to protect him. Obviously, that special team's play, play for more than 100 yards was exceptional. But Ward, this kid Ward Jr. was was special as well. I'm looking at Shane Dunbar. He was special with 77 receptions for 125 yards. Isaiah Johnson had a, a big-time 44-yard catch. I'm looking at Catalan. 
uh, who averaged four yards a carry. Overall, what stood out to me, however, was Houston's defense and how they disrupted Oklahoma's offense. That's what stood out to me as the biggest surprise. And then I look at Texas. It's not the fact that they gave up 47 because I don't, I'm not that enthralled with their defense. But offensively, this kid, Shane Bouchelle, I mean, I give a lot of credit where credit is due to Coach Charlie Strong. When you've got Swoops, who was once a quarterback, he's a senior in there. He's helping to bring the freshman along, not to mention he runs for a winning touchdown. And then you look at Jared Hurd, who had a big-time 68-yard catch, and he was a quarterback last year. What you're seeing is interchangeable parts at Texas, guys who used to play a position, giving way to somebody else who might be better, changing a position, seemingly willing to do what's in the best interest of the team. And that speaks to the culture that Charlie Strong is building there. When we, when we talked about Charlie Strong in the past, we lamented some of the changes that he was making, throwing guys off the team like nine different dudes ended up being pushed off the team or leaving or what have you. You kind of wondered what was going on with the culture there. But now you're seeing these guys together very enthusiastic about playing, playing in front of 102,000 last night um, and seeing guys that, you know, again, played one position, giving way to somebody that might be better and willing to show that level of team chemistry that lends itself towards success. So I would say Houston and Texas ended up being very, very pleasant surprises for me, Oklahoma, huge disappointment. That was what entered my mind from a surprise perspective more than anything else. I'll say, I just got to say before, uh, before I even answer the question, what a game last night. I mean, what a win by Texas because when number 77, right. Vahey, I think you pronounce his name, Patrick Vahey, yep. gets called on that chop block and then they start losing ground, you just felt like, okay, they don't know how to win yet, that terrible sports cliche, here comes Notre Dame. And that, as someone pointed out on Twitter last night uh, to me as I tweeted about the game, the fact that Vahey's then the guy with the block that springs the, the touchdown that wins the game in overtime – uh, swoops. Uh, that, that's a great redemption story. So it, that, it's going to be tough to beat that game all year long. But I'd say the biggest surprise is actually USC. Look, we all know Alabama's great every year. Stephen A., you picked them against the field on Friday. But you also said, you know, they had a tough game coming up against the Trojans. And Nick Saban, after the game's talking about he's not pleased with the performance, you just beat, as Marley said, you just beat the brakes off of SC, a ranked team. SC is a surprise to me because they are not making progress. Every year, it seems, they have a top recruiting class. This year, it was 11th in the nation. Last year, it was third. In 2012, they were the AP had them number one ranked in the preseason, and they don't seem to make any progress. This is the storied uh, franchise on the West Coast, certainly. UCLA is now pushing them, uh, and, and SC is not only not making gains, they're losing ground every year, it seems. Gone through four head coaches now uh, in the last, what, five and a half years? It's just a mess out there, and every year you see that recruiting class. They have a new head coach almost every year, it seems. Now a new AD, and you think, okay, here it comes. They got their scholarships back. You know, the sanctions in terms of the, of the bowl games are over. Here it comes, and, and the only thing that came, yet, that came over the weekend was Alabama putting a whooping on them. I mean, we all know the SEC, the defense, and, and Alabama especially, and how fast and big and everything, but it's not – it's like – it's not even the same college football level. It looks like a pro team playing against kids. And for especially for people out in L.A., and I was just there for five-plus years, this has got to be tough to swallow. Well, of course it's tough because you're in Southern California living in that sunshine. You didn't expect to get trolloped and embarrassed the way that you did. All of a sudden, the day seems quite rainy. It's very, very embarrassing in Southern California in this afternoon, but they'll get over it. They went up against Roll Tide, baby. Everybody ain't Roll Tide. You don't, you don't need to expect one this last, to happen in the future. One last thing about Alabama. It's not fit. You give Nick Saban an actual quarterback, and Jalen Hurts, Jalen Hurts. Boy, that looks like an actual quarterback. That's not even fair. It's not. I still take the, the field against Alabama, but that's, it, it's like, you got to be kidding me. But you don't mean it. But you don't mean it. You don't mean that you're going to take the field. Because, again, like you just said, you know, you just talked about Jalen Hurts. So, you, really, you know, you just talking, Max. You don't really mean it. You don't mean it. You know good and well that you need to roll with Alabama. You know you don't need to take the field. Just admit it right here on national television. You go ahead. I'll give you permission. Go ahead. Go ahead. Admit it. Admit it. Come Not over with it. the time. Hey, come come on. with the time. Let's see how FSU. Come with the time. Let's tie. see how FSU looks Roll against Ole Miss tonight. FSU looks good. 
Roll I with gotta the admit, top. man, That'll I'm, be a I'm good tempted, one. but I'm not doing it. No, field over Come on Alabama. Look in. Come on over. Look, guys, SC looking like the boys of Troy against Bama. Hopefully they will look like the men of Troy this weekend when they face Utah State. After oh, Utah the break, State. though, oh. one of the best point guards in the NBA in the house. There he is. Grizzly star Mike Conley. Come on out. I finally have company. He's joining us next. We'll get into the Kaepernick situation and so much more. I have company. How are you? Thank you so much for being here. We're going to get you a chair. And, uh, but I'm one of the best point guards in the NBA in this offseason, he was paid like it, signing one of the most lucrative deals in NBA history to stay in Memphis. We welcome Grizzly star Mike Conley to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Let's start here with a hot topic this offseason, which has obviously been athletes and social activism. What was your reaction, Mike, to the Colin Kaepernick protest? Well, um, you know, first, I think that he has the right um, to protest peacefully. And that's what he's doing. Um, unfortunately, I think his message is getting kind of lost in the fact that the way he's doing it, uh, which a lot of people have, uh, you know, take offense to. So, but it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of courage of what he's doing. Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for the men and women uh, serving our, you know, uh, you know, for our country and uh, allowing us to be in the position that we're in today. So. Um, you know, it's definitely a, a tough, a tough subject, but it needs to be addressed, and, um, and it's bringing some awareness. Mike, always good seeing you, bro. I'm happy for you. Get that paper. Uh, <laughs> but let me ask, but let me ask you this question: um, We've seen others step up, whether it be in the NFL, uh, the female soccer player, take a kneel, uh, but nevertheless, putting some sort of sort of effort forward to bring attention to what Colin Kaepernick's position is. Do you anticipate that that is something that could potentially take place come this N NBA season? Well, you know, I don't, I don't count it out. Um, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily one to, to know for sure if guys are, are going to bite and, and, and follow suit. But um, I think more needs to be done, uh, you know, than just aware, you know, awareness and raising awareness. I think we have to get out in the field and, and, and try to make change as well. So. Um, I'm one who's donated, you know, a million dollars to Grizzlies Foundation in order to help, um, you know, th throughout the city of Memphis and trying to raise awareness and do these things. But at the same time, it's not about money or, um, you know, how much awareness you can necessarily raise. You have to get out there and try to, you know, do it yourself and, uh, and try to make change. And that's something that all us athletes have to do a better job of. Go ahead, Mike, Ryan Hollins was raving about your leadership ability, and I asked him for some specifics because he played with you, uh, for people who don't know, the veteran backup center uh, on Memphis last year. And he was talking about how if there's something to be done in the community and it involves shovels, you jump down into the ditch and start, and so the whole team follows you down there and, and, and does it too, and that brings a kind of sense of community uh, on the team in Memphis. Why do you think it is... Just switching to NBA for a second, why do you think it is that more players in your position, point guards in this point guard era, don't do stuff like that? Don't take the leadership role that, that, you've, that, you've, act that you've assumed, obviously. Well, you know, it's hard to say. Um, I feel like I feel an obligation to it um, in the position that I've, I'm in and the opportunity I have, um, the platform that I have as a, as a basketball player in America. Uh, all of us, you know, have a responsibility to our communities. Uh, we're role models, whether we, we whether we like it or not, and that's something that uh, it comes with uh, being a being a professional athlete. So to get out there in the community, to embrace the role, um, really show your face, you know, not just on TV, not just speaking about it, but actually going into those neighborhoods and in those in those bad places and seeing uh, people who who really need help and uh, and and you know, promising. Not just promising, but doing and, and, and showing that you really care about uh, their lives and, and, and the betterment of their, their communities. Mike, let me transition when you see back Kaepernick, to. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Steve. I'm sorry, let me transition to basketball because we are talking to an individual uh, that, that played very good basketball for the Memphis Grizzlies for years. You just, I'm not telling your business, but damn it, it was in the press all of these months <laughs> $153 million, okay? Now, people look at those dollars. You don't have a championship on your resume. That ain't your fault, mm -hmm. but you don't have a championship on your resume. A lot of people look at the money DeMar DeRozan, yourself, Bradley Beal, and others have gotten, and a lot of folks are thinking the pressure is going to mount significantly because with the money that's been doled out to these players, you know, 
at some point in time, they're going to want it to pay championship dividends. I want to know if you thought about that and how fair do you think it is for Joe Public out there and, and Molly Public out there to have <laughs> that kind of attitude? Well, um, you know, at first glance, it, it, it all the money looks outrageous. But, you know, we're just the first. You know, I think in the next years, um, they'll see a lot of other people getting paid and, and we'll be, you know, yesterday's news. So, um, but for now, uh, as far as the pressure, I think as athletes, we put pressure on ourselves regardless uh, to perform at a high level, especially myself. And um, it's an opportunity, you know, more so than anything that I'm excited for. You know, with that money, um, I feel like my role can change and I can do more and, and, and you know, really get out there and, and, and show people what I can do. Max, excuse me for interjecting, but Mike, I got to ask, I got to follow up with this. With the money that's being doled out there, what about those who look and question whether or not the incentive is going to still be there, not for you, because your character speaks for itself, not for the guys I mentioned, because those are good dudes with good character. But with the money that's being doled out there, people may question, where's the incentive to go out there and really, really produce when you know no matter what you do, you're going to get this paper coming your way? What do you say to that? Well, you know, I think all of us got here um, in this position, you know, through hard work. It wasn't given to anybody. You know, we all had to go through our, our sacrifices, our obstacles, and, um, you know, to get to get to this position. There's so many people want to be professional athletes, and there's so little, you know, amount of people in this world who get that opportunity. And um, I think that doesn't leave an athlete, you know, regardless of what you get paid. Some of them, you know, I can't speak for everybody, but some of them may you know, once they get paid, take a back seat and, and relax. But a lot of, the, you know, the majority of these athletes in all sports, um, you know, really play with a lot of pride and integrity, and, and I don't think that'll change. All right. How do you stop Golden State, Mike? How do you match up with those guys? How do you stop that team? <laughs> um, first off, it'll be fun. I tell you that, you know, it's a, we're all competitors, and, uh, and that's going to be a, uh, you know, the team on everybody's, you know, list. You know, we got to try to, you know, go out there and try to knock them off. It's the only way we're going to get out of the West is to beat or go through Golden State. And, um, and it'll be, you know, a, a tough task, you know, with uh, Kevin Durant joining and already the kind of, you know, the cast of guys they have there and uh, the coaching staff and the, the system that they play. It's, it's going to be a, a tough task. Shocking those two disagreed on KD going, whether they like the move or not. <laughs> Mike, again. I didn't like it. <laughs> Surprising, right? Love it. Thank you so much for being here with us. We appreciate it. Again, Good congratulations you, on Thank the you. on the new deal. Good luck this season. And uh, we, we appreciate it. And also applaud you on donating the $1 million. That's huge. Thank you very much. Great work by you. Coming up next, he did make the final cut of the 49ers roster, but wasn't able to regain the starting quarterback spot. That belongs to Blaine Gabbert, who has the worst QBR since he entered the league. Cap led San Francisco to two NFC Championship games and a Super Bowl appearance, but his performance on the field has dipped, and he's battled injuries of late. Max, did Colin Kaepernick's activism cost him his starting spot? The answer is no. No, it didn't. And I know, I know how that sounds. It sounds naive, right? Like, oh, you don't, you don't get it. This is the way it works if you stand up. And actually, in this case, no. And I realize here we are on Labor Day and the history of just like leaving race and protest aside, the history of just labor organizing to stop being exploited is rich in this country and and that doesn't precisely relate to this but certainly Colin Kaepernick falls in the worker part not management here um, but no he is not being exploited or manipulated uh, by being kept on the roster but not given the starting job I don't think this is a political thing at all if you review it he lost his job last season. He lost his starter's job last season, not this season. The question was, would he stick on the roster this season? Remember, before the season starts, he asks out. So then the question was, wow, he's in real decline. He already lost his job. There's a new coach. He wants out. Is he even going to have the locker room? Then he shows up skinny. And, and Chip Kelly on the record's like, he's really under his playing weight. He's got to get his weight up, literally. Then he's talking about a dead arm, which to me says, wait, is he injured in some way that we don't know about? What do you mean dead arm? He can't throw the ball all of a sudden? And then comes the protest. Still doesn't have the job when he protests. The question was, 
Would he be kept on the roster? Stephen A., the answer is yes. The man is still on the roster. Why would you keep a guy on the roster? That creates the distraction if you don't plan on getting use out of him. So you're creating the maximum distraction for the minimum reward? That doesn't make sense to me. He's on the roster because at this moment, I think Chip Kelly believes he's their second best quarterback. I believe at some point this season, maybe before even the halfway mark, Chip Kelly will believe if Kaepernick is healthy, that Kaepernick is in fact their best quarterback and he will win back the starting job but no his not having it now is not about his protest I believe you're wrong and I believe you're wrong because of two reasons um, that would happen to be Chip Kelly and Trent Baalke now let's take into consideration I want to make sure that I emphasize Chip Kelly and Trent Baalke because under no circumstances would I make this kind of uh, uh, a proclamation against any other organization in all of the NFL. I'm talking about those two individuals. In the case of Trent Baalke you have an individual who had a winning coach and basically because of your personal relationship with him you got you 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 partnered with the owner and got the CEO essentially to co-sign you basically getting in his way, sabotaging his level of productivity and throwing the franchise to the wolves at the expense of the fan base and the organization itself. That's the Trent Baalke we're talking about here. Also a Trent Baalke who wants to talk to the media as little as possible, who wants to engage in spin and manipulation as, as, as much as possible. This is what his MO has been. I don't know the man. I've never met the man. I'm just talking about what NFL aficionados have told me. In the case of Chip Kelly, I'm significantly closer to that situation. Let's take into account what, co what players accused Chip Kelly of, how he didn't vibe with them, and how, you know, his terms, in terms of his, his personable uh, abilities and his ability to ingratiate himself with players, particularly of African-American descent, was suspect. Let's not forget that. Let's not forget about his unconventional tendencies, clocking what guys did, when they did it, how they did it, what was their sleep patterns, what was their diet like, who was their girlfriends, where did they hang out, et cetera, et cetera. These are the kind of things that Chip Kelly was known for doing in the midst of going 26 and 21, in fairness to him, as a head coach with the Philadelphia 76ers. Back to back, Philadelphia Eagles, I'm sorry, back to back 10 and 6 seasons, and then 6 and 9 before he got booted out there in, in the penultimate game of last season. Think about the history that comes associated with Chip Kelly. Think about the brothers who had something to say about their relationship or lack thereof with Chip Kelly. Then couple that with it being Colin Kaepernick, him taking the position that he's taking, him being very out front with it, not consulting with the team before he did it, creating this maelstrom of controversy, wearing the afro looking like a member of the Black Panthers in this day and age in the eyes of somebody like Chip Kelly. In fairness to Chip Kelly, he did come on the record and say he had no problem with it, but that's what he had to say. Because what the hell is Chip Kelly going to admit? That I got a problem with it? That I don't like this distraction? That I don't like it being about anything other than football? Blah, blah, blah. He can't say that. Not with his recent history in Philadelphia when he's lucky to have a job in San Francisco. So that's what you have to take but into consideration. let's not confuse the what chronology. Okay. Go ahead. Let's not confuse the chronology because he'd already lost his job. Look, if Chip Kelly's hubris, if you want to talk about that, it's about more than anything the impression that he thinks his system and his strategy is it. more important than the actual pieces on the chessboard. That those guys are more interchangeable than they are. And at the moment, he believes Gabbert's the best guy to run his system. But he said Kaepernick's got to get his weight up. I take that to mean when he does, well, if he gets well, back to being cap, he got the job. Yeah. But, but, but your argument is about football. My argument is, is that Chip Kelly has a history of, of making football decisions based on what most of us would perceive to be non-football matters. I don't trust him yet. So because of that, it's not beyond the pale that this had something to do, not everything, but this had something to do with influencing his decision, and I'm rolling with that. The news would be if Cap got the job. The news that Cap doesn't have the starter's job, that's not news. The news would to be, Blaine oh, Gabbert, Cap won back the job. 8 and 27, Blaine Gabbert. Oh, Blaine Gabbert Listen, thinks. Listen, you and I are on the same Chris page Bob about that, but not the, not, not the Niners. Gentlemen, we got to agree to disagree on this one. By the way, President Barack Obama says Kaepernick has the right to protest. And you'll see the Niners host the L.A. Rams in the nightcap of our Monday night football doubleheader. That one on ESPN. The earlier game is Stephen A. Steelers at the Redskins. First Take is brought to you by Cabela's. Get to Cabela's for all your hunting, fishing, camping, and outdoor needs.
Modelo Especial, brewed with a fighting spirit since 1925. And StubHub, your ticket out. This week, Wednesday, John Gruden in the house. Looking forward to that. And Thursday, Fat Joe stops by, so tune in. Meanwhile, Seahawks defensive end Cliff Averill made a lasting impression on Tony Romo when his sack sidelined Romo for six to ten weeks. Now, according to the Star-Telegram, Averill reached out to Romo, telling him he didn't intentionally hurt him. Romo texted him back saying, quote, you take care of the NFC West. We'll see you on the playoffs. Max, is Romo right? <laughs> Tony Romo's mouth is writing checks. His clavicle, vertebrae, and defense can't cash. Ditto. That's it. No, I'm glad you said right. that. I'm glad you said that. You know what? Listen, I appreciate Tony Romo. Let's applaud Tony Romo for something. I mean, considering the fact that he's only had two playoff wins in his entire career and the Dallas Cowboys only had two playoff wins in the last 20 years, let's give Tony Romo credit for dreaming. Dreams are what the world is made of. You've got to dream it to achieve it. At least he has one part right. Let's do that for Tony Romo. How about them Cowboys? Ain't going to achieve How it. How about them Cowboys? Gentlemen, <laughs> have a wonderful Labor Day, and thanks to all of you as well. See you tomorrow.